All right. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Alejandro Cremades, one of the founders here at the uh, OneBest. And uh, I'm actually today here in sunny Philadelphia, where I just came out of a marathon of, uh, of lectures uh, here at Wharton. And uh, I am right now, I sneaked into an office here to actually be able to give this, uh, this webinar with all of you in, in attendance. And I'm actually very excited to be discussing today startup investing. So today the webinar is uh, Startup Investing 101. Many of you are interested in uh, exploring these opportunities with us. And, and I think that um, it would make sense to actually walk you through the process and then uh, perhaps uh, for you to, to learn as much as possible, to be armed with all the resources that you need in this uh, environment. So just to introduce myself, as mentioned, I am Alejandro Cremades. Uh, it's uh, pretty um, uh, fulfilling when I'm able to uh, hear people that, I able, that are able to pronounce well my name. So uh, thank you so much for your patience uh, in advance for keeping up with this accent of mine. I'm, I'm from Spain originally, but I've been now uh, for seven years now in the US. So I would say that uh, a US resident, thank God. So um, I'm also the, the executive chairman as well, and uh, I've been pushing this, um, this idea or this uh, company since, since 2010, way before the World Crowdfunding had a definition or before the Jobs Act uh, was in the picture. We would actually uh, walk you over a little bit through, through, that, uh, through that Jobs Act so that you understand a little bit more and, and have more of an educational uh, perspective on that uh, front. But anyways, my background is in law. I used to um, practice as an attorney in this firm called King & Spalding, where I was involved in high-profile investment arbitration cases. One of them was one of the largest ones in, in history. And then and also I've been, I guess, lecturing, which I love. I love to, to engage with students, uh, teach them all the mistakes that we've done uh, since we started pushing this, this company. And, and then as well, some media recognition, like for example, last year, some good rankings that I received on, on Entrepreneur Magazine and then as well Vanity Fair with the under 30, top 30 under 30 a program. So every webinar should have a great disclaimer. And uh, as you see here, we're not uh, a broker dealer ourselves. We have a great partner, which is North Capital. And then we are not, uh, as you see here, I mean, we're not, uh, you, you need to do your research and, and really um, at the end of the day when you're making an investment, it's uh, all about having as much of, a, of an educational perspective as possible. So it makes sense to perhaps have the, the advice of your legal uh, counsel or, or perhaps your, your advisors. So this is some of the other recognition that we've received. And then really our vision, what's our vision? So our vision is to be able to democratize access to capital and to empower individuals to make informed decisions. So uh, basically what we're doing now is cracking the door open of the Silicon Valley Insider Club. I mean, this is, we're looking at what we're doing now. It could be us or, or other platforms. Is the biggest change that the financial service industry has experienced in the past 80 years. Uh, I mean, with uh, the Jobs Act, which we would jump uh, uh, in a little bit, what we're doing is really bringing to every single um, individual right now is uh, only accredited investors the possibility to invest in startup companies, which was something that was unheard of uh, before. So to give you an idea, the type of uh, companies or, I mean, what we're doing at OneBest is, uh, I mean, most of you know this uh, because you are uh, vivid users of the platform and for that we're very grateful but uh, what we do is we connect early stage technology companies with accredited investors. Um, they could be either uh, individuals, they could be venture capital firms, uh, private equity, family offices, and so forth. Uh, but it's really tech enabled businesses. It's all about companies that have the potential to uh, achieve being a high growth business and giving those returns back to investors. Out of, for example, the, all the applications that we receive, only 3% of the companies that apply actually make it to be able to fundraise on the platform. So really we're, we're targeting the top notch or at least what, what we believe could be the top notch uh, ventures out there that they come already with a sophisticated lead investor that is leading the round and establishing the terms before we even take a look at it. So as you would see, uh, I was mentioning that um, it's a, it, it varies the type of stages that we see on the platform. We have 
companies from a seed level perspective raising money, which is uh, for the most part the first round right after that friends and family or bootstrapping the business. We also have a bridge round in which the companies are looking to perhaps extend their runway so that they're able to keep pushing on the metrics to raise the institutional round. And then we also have the Series A rounds uh, in which we have companies that bring already sophisticated uh, institutional investors that are establishing the, the, the terms of the round and, uh, and so forth. So with that being said, I mean, they're for the most part tech enabled. Uh, we have different types of sectors. We cover from healthcare to um, uh, e-commerce. I mean, it's a uh, quite uh, diverse, all the spectrum and the, and the type of verticals that we cover. So we have great um, uh, accelerator programs that we're partners with also universities. I mean, today here at Wharton, I, I love it. Uh, those students really give me a lot of energy. Uh, and then here is the agenda of what we're going to be covering today. So, we're going to be covering the basics of uh, startup investing. Also, we're going to be comparing startup investing versus other investment options. We're going to be choosing uh, really the process of how to choose a startup investment. How does that look? How does that look like? Also, the terminology and the technical skills, and then what happens after making a startup investment. So, I would say that uh, that if you have any questions at all. Please feel free to um, actually on the Q&A, you could either ask the questions. We're going to leave some time for that. We're going to leave at least 10 minutes. And then if you have any other questions right now while we are uh, going through the presentation, you have here on your right here on your, on your go to webinar control panel, you would be able to uh, ask anything that you have. If you're experiencing any type of technical issues, our folks, my colleagues will be able to, to help you out. And, and then I'll try to address some of the questions before I actually jump into into details here with the with the webinar itself. So let's jump here right into the into the presentation, into the basics of, of startup investing. No? So the startup investing market is is quite large. Uh, I think that it's important to really make the distinction between the angel investors and then also the venture capital investors. I mean the term angel investor really comes from the Broadway shows back in the day. No? I mean these were the people that were really investing the uh, behind uh, this uh, this um, uh, theatrical uh, I would say like um, uh, shows and so forth that they were putting together and as a result of that uh, now every person that invests in a startup company is called an angel investor every individual right the industry is significantly um, is, is very large uh, we're looking at a over 20 billion dollar industry it's uh, increasing year over year which is great and uh, and then I mean if you compare this to for example uh, venture capital, um, I mean, venture capital is still big, especially on early stages, uh, but um, what I would have to say here is that it's it's very different one to another. I mean, angel investors uh, typically invest in companies that range in valuations all the way up to like two to three million. Uh, venture capital firms are more of the larger check sizes, the checks that are going to be coming uh, at the end of the day uh, when there is a, when there is a, Sorry, it seems like there is a no sound here. Uh, Tony, who is saying that he has no sound? Um, anyways, uh, basically, I think I think you guys can hear me. If anyone does have any problems hearing me, please uh, throw in a message here on the on the go to webinar control panel, and and we will get it fixed. So um, let me know. Uh, basically, what I was saying, going back to the presentation here, the webinar, uh, the type of valuations that you would see on angels is much lower than what you would see on Okay, perfect. Anthony and, and the rest, thank you so much for saying that you can hear me. This is wonderful because I don't know if I can rely on the, on the Wi-Fi of this university. I've never used it. So, uh, but anyways, what I was saying is that uh, the venture capital firms tend to invest a little bit later uh, in the process. And, uh, and that's why I would say that an angel investor probably is going to take more risk, right? Because you're investing early on when perhaps that wheel that the entrepreneur is uh, assembling is not yet turning at the speed in which normally a, normally a venture capital firm uh, actually invest in. But I think that the beautiful thing about being an angel investor is that you get to perhaps uh, participate more in that uh, uh, return, right? In that return environment, because by investing earlier, yes, the risk is greater, but also the, the reward could be uh, larger, right? In the event there is an exit. But I think, and we would actually touch into this a little bit later, it is very important that you get to diversify as much as possible so that you're able to uh, hedge your bets and to perhaps uh, choose the, 
the companies that are going to help you to not only recover from the losses, but then perhaps give you the returns overall. No? So startup investing basics. So basically uh, what startup investing is, is uh, the possibility to invest in those companies that have the potential to become a high growth business. Uh, these are the companies that are going to give you the return anywhere between five to seven years it takes some time to actually uh, get those returns out of these investments. So this is not like investing in the public markets in which you can uh, uh, liquidate your, your investment, your position right off the bat. In startup investing, you actually need to have a liquidity event. It needs to happen, uh, M&A transaction, the company gets acquired, uh, also an IPO, perhaps a round of funding. Those are the scenarios in which you as, a, as an investor are going to be able or is going to be able to get those returns back on your investment. So it's a, it's definitely risky. It's a highly liquid, but as long as you're able to really embrace a, being able to diversify, you would be able to perhaps say, if you get lucky or if you do well your due diligence, a, do good for yourself. You know? So let's talk about the, the a, a, let's see here on the next slide, we're gonna be talking about startup investing versus other investment options. So here, as you see, the way of the, really the, the life cycle of a company, it all comes down to, um, from a financing perspective, the company is always going to try to bootstrap as much as possible so that they're able to um, uh, decrease or really minimize that dilution right off the bat. I guess that the, the mistake that entrepreneurs make is to raise money before they have that wheel uh, assembled. Uh, the idea is to really invest or raise money if you're the founder when uh, you just need the money to turn the wheel faster. And those are the types of businesses that you as an investor should really take a look at. So as you see here, there's different life cycles. First, it starts with the friends and family with that first and second degree connections of the uh, entrepreneur. And then you open it up to business angels. Uh, this is people like yourselves, right? So uh, perhaps you're not in that first or second degree uh, network of the founder, but now thanks to platforms like, for example, OneBest, you get the opportunity to see all these different uh, different types of opportunities. So the next step is going to be to get the, 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 the venture capital money in the door. Uh, so um, friends and family business angel rounds, they're, they, they're called seed rounds. Uh, normally you would see perhaps a bridge round if the company is not ready yet with the metrics for a venture capital investment. But then what you have is what they call in the financing arena for startups, the series A round. So the series A round, and this could go all the way to whichever letter, um, they uh, normally what it is, is you're looking at check sizes anywhere from uh, 3 million to, to it, go, it can go all the way up to 15 million. But uh, that's really the series A. It's funny because the series A's today are what uh, we called series B's back in 2015. I mean, uh, sorry, 2005, I mean, you're seeing all these um, investors, all these institutional investors, they're getting more sophisticated, which is great for the industry. And um, and yeah, and they get a little bit pickier. So that's the, the venture capital rounds. And then the idea is to really uh, follow on on the company, especially if you have that good institutional investor that is going to take care of your invest or your investment as an accredited investor, right? To push and continue to finance the company until the company is able to really make an exit. It could be either uh, by financing the company, it could be by bringing uh, other partnerships and, and helping to open doors with the uh, um, business development deals and, and so forth. So the characteristics of this asset class. So we really touched on this. So um, obviously it's, you're, you need to look at anywhere from five to eight years is highly liquid. And then the ROI expectation, I think that what it is important is not only to look at the ROI that you may perhaps get of these startups, but then also what can you contribute and what is, a, what is your passion? I think that one of the uh, most critical things as an investor in startups is that you create a framework for yourself, meaning you need to create an investment thesis in which uh, perhaps there is a specific vertical in which you have a knowledge or a, or a background that is going to help you to um, to, to really make better analysis. It could be on the market, it could be on the team and, uh, and so forth. So if for example, I mean, we had this company that raised 750K, which was in the healthcare space. And we had a ton of doctors that actually came in and, and invested in that, in that deal because they understood, they understood the need. 
they understood well what the company uh, requirements were down the down the road and and they were passionate about just being part of of that solution that that company was uh, providing so i guess that really creating that framework is really going to help you in making uh, sound decisions that are going to you know perhaps increase the potential of of finding a a liquidity event that would provide you returns so how can i minimize my risk so here we're talking about the, the, the investment portfolio and then also the, the framework that we already touched on and, and then also the, the co-investments. I would say that it's just like that rule of thumb. Uh, ultimately, what you want to do is you want to make sure that uh, on all the companies that you invest in, I mean, again, we're talking about diversifying the investment, you need to take into consideration that one-third of your investments is going to you know, go out of business. I mean, these are startups. It's a high, highly risky. Another third is going to break even. And then the other third is going to be the one that it really gives you that home run that not only would recover you from the losses, but as well help you to to get some good returns on, on the overall investment that you're allocating into startups. So that's why diversification is, is critical. We already touched on the on the framework that uh, we discussed, but I want to touch a little bit on the on the co-investment with trusted individuals. What I've seen and 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 we've seen this, I mean, with with angel groups offline. What I've seen is that there is um, a lot of individuals out there that perhaps you know have a group of friends or a group of uh, trusted relationships that uh, they want to co-invest with in a way in which. Um, you know that if, let's say, the three of you are not agreeing to actually go forward with that investment, eh, it's because something is missing. The, the, I, I think that ultimately being able to crowdsource the process with people that you trust and that you respect is very powerful. So if eh, not everyone is on board, perhaps there is there is a missing piece that eh, you know eh, it makes sense to address, and maybe the company is just not ready for you, maybe down the road. So that could be a good way to minimize the risk. So choosing a startup investment. So when we're talking about choosing a startup investment, there is a whole process that uh, that comes uh, you know, into place. So obviously the first uh, the first one is the due diligence. So we are actually, uh, you know, ourselves on the platform, we are helping to do the due diligence from a business perspective to a legal perspective. We have an investment committee as well before the company is even listed on the site. I mean, I, I think I touched on this. Only 3% of the companies that come to the platform actually make it on the platform. But regardless, whether you are uh, dealing with the company and finding them on our platform or on any other platform, or for example, finding the company in the offline world, there is different pieces of uh, uh, information and ingredients that you could really take into consideration before you know moving further in the process. So it could be uh, you know like you need to explore like the market, you need to explore the legal side, like how they were able to incorporate and you know like the vesting schedules. I mean all these types of uh, information that maybe you know it makes sense for you to know. It could be uh, you know like background checks on the individuals. I mean. I think that there is a whole uh, lot of things that you can do on the due diligence side to make sure that you're investing in something that you know it gains your trust. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I think that we are in a world that is changing. It's changing by the minute, and with this, I mean that now you have the online process. I mean, all these different platforms and tools that you could use that bring much more transparency to the process of actually investing in in, in startup companies. So. That's a very, very exciting. I mean, 10 years, 15 years ago, it was really hard to, to be able to find someone online and, you know, like see where that person studied or who you're connected with that knows that individual that perhaps, you know, can give you some feedback on previous experiences. You know, it could be on, on any of the management team. I mean, I think that that's pretty powerful. So the next point is be willing to lose your principle. I guess that uh, that's, uh, that's very important because at the end of the day, this is startup investing. I mean, you need to allocate, and you know, this is something that you need to speak with your advisors and so forth. But you need to allocate a a a, a, a small portion, really, of of that portfolio to these types of deals. I mean, if you speak with wealth management divisions, they would probably talk about anywhere from like five to eight percent. But I mean, I guess it depends. Eh? And you know, obviously, you need to get educated on that front. And then I think that from a founder perspective, I really feel strongly about this one is to be respectful of everyone's time. When you are a, an entrepreneur, the clock is ticking when you're raising money. Every single minute counts. And I would say that for the founder, 
uh, time is their, their worst enemy. While, for example, for investors, time is their best friend, right? Because the more you wait, the more you're able to see like how that venture is performing and so forth. But ultimately, you're building a relationship. Also, you know, remember that the ecosystem is small and people talk. And um, it is important that if you are not sure or if you're not uh, very convinced, just 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 say no um, to the founder. Don't be afraid to say no. I'm not interested, or you know, like it just this is not what I'm looking for, or whichever. Because the founder is really going to appreciate that. That's time that the founder could invest, in, you know, in someone else that perhaps would you know be interested in in their business. So please keep that in mind. So how do you judge the accuracy of the valuation? I mean, here are some of the factors that really you know are you know need to be taken into account like for example the strength of, of, of the leadership team I mean who is behind that the size of the opportunity I think that there is three things really uh, for example that are important one is the size of the market I mean ultimately if the everyone in the investing world I mean they talk about team 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 as the most important ingredient but you could have the most important team or the greatest team in the world but if the market is very small the, the potential of gaining incredible and unimaginable wealth or returns for your investment is going to be also reduced and limited. So first is the market size, then is the team, and then you can look at all the other different factors that are going to really have a, a, a pretty important and influential piece in, in the accuracy of that valuation. For the most part on um, OneBase, for example, the companies that we bring to the platform, they are already backed and they already have a lead investor that has established these different terms of the valuation. It's also something that we use as a safeguard for the investors that we have on the platform because as an entrepreneur and, and speaking, you know, myself, you know, in, in the voice of all these founders, you always want to shoot for the moon. But it's important to to get grounded, to be adjusted, to know what the real you know, market value of, of your company is, and that's why having a lead investor, a third party that really puts that value on the company makes sense for other investors like yourselves to perhaps say consider this. I mean, in, in the offline world, if, if you're planning to perhaps say lead around and, and get really involved, there is, for example, these factors that you can take into consideration, but then there's a lot of data out there. I mean, there, it's, it's again, it's, it's this online effect and this level of transparency that right now, it's out there and that, you know, you could really take advantage of, you know, perhaps you could uh, be a follower of someone that you respect and that you trust and always invest with that individual. I mean, there's different ways really to, to have that, uh, that accuracy on the, on the value. No? So let's talk about now the terminology and the technical details. So let's see here. Let's jump to the next slide. And I think that the first important, um, I would say, factor is when we're talking about the structure of the round, right? Like how you're going to be coming in, what type of investment is that going to be? So uh, especially when we're talking about early stage investing in, in, this type of, in this type of startups, there's two ways of doing so. One is via convertible notes, and then two is via equity rounds. So the convertible notes, I mean, as you see here, um, basically the way it works is the company is putting, let's say, a cap, which is like the ceiling for the investors. There's also a discount on, on the next round of financing that the entrepreneur is giving you. And then there's also an interest that is going to be accrued on a yearly basis. So for example, uh, and, and also just so you know, convertible notes are much cheaper and much faster than, than equity rounds because on convertible notes, you don't need to negotiate a whole lot of terms like you would do in the equity rounds and and it's just, it's just much smoother. Sometimes it makes sense for uh, these early stage companies, especially if they don't have like a lot of traction on the revenue, but perhaps they have a good uh, strategies for customer acquisition and they have good month over month uh, growth in terms of engagement with their user base. The convertible note is a good way, you know, in that case to, to really extend uh, not putting a value in your business and letting later on an institutional investor come in and, and say, okay, your company is valued at, at whichever amount. No? So really it's a good way to rely on very good and, and sophisticated investors to make that, uh, that, that decision. So as I was saying, there's going to be only in terms of negotiation, the interest rate, as you see here, I mean, what, what you can see out there, it, it really varies, but it's a interesting, you know, like sometimes it's 8%, sometimes it's less than that. I mean, I've seen up north of that. 
And then the discount as well, uh, again, that's uh, what is going to be establishing on the, on the next round. So for example, if you are investing, let's say today in a convertible note, uh, and there's a discount of whichever amount, let's say of 20 to 25%, if there was um, later on an institutional round, let's say established at 20 million, that means that you are converting your notes or that debt into um, equity, not at the valuation of 20 million, but at the 20 or 25 percent discount of that, which was established on these terms of the convertible note. So it's a good way to um, gain automatically a pretty uh, a significant value on the value by on the valuation by coming in a little bit lower. So that's for example for the discount. Now, if we're talking about a cap, there are some companies that do convertible notes with caps or without caps. Basically, when you're putting a cap, is a kind of like establishing a valuation on the business, uh, but but not not really, right? So the way it would work is, for example, if you're putting a cap, let's say at five million, if you were to raise, let's say, at the valuation of 20 million on the next round, then that means that you're not coming at 20 million, but the ceiling has been established for the convertible note holders at five million. So you're gaining a lot in value right off the bat. It's a good way to kind of like establish the ceiling and to really establish that safeguard for you as an investor to know like how much uh, you're gonna be owning of the company later on. <clears throat> so again, the interest is important, the discount is important, and then also the cap uh, when you're talking about convertible note rounds. So now let's talk about equity rounds, right? This is the other uh, flavor or the other type of, um, of way of investing in a startup and, and structuring an offering. So the way it works is you're always going to need a valuation. There's always going to be terms that need to be established by the lead investor the lead investor for the most part is someone that is sophisticated, uh, someone that has uh, uh, done rounds of financing before in the past in other companies. It could be either an angel investor, an angel group, uh, a venture capital investor. So you see different types of, of flavors really when it comes to leading around. Uh, really what, you, what you're gonna be able to find, like it says here, on one best is for the most part, uh, all companies that have that sophisticated lead uh, that uh, level of traction and momentum already on the on the round, so you are investing in something that has already been done uh, before. So let's see the the next thing. The next thing is the syndicate. So when we're talking about a syndicate, it means that uh, there is a lead investor that has come in that has established the terms of the round, but it's not really taking all the round, meaning investing the whole amount that the startup needs. Uh, to actually, you know, execute the operations, right? So the way it would work is the lead investor typically either gets everything or maybe gets like up north of like 15 to 20 percent of the round, establishes the terms, and basically what the syndicate means is the other investors that are going to come as followers, that's the term that is used, to fill the rest of the round. I mean, this is something that, for example, that we see on the on this on these companies that are raising money on one base, it's a, it's basically, you see the companies already with that lead investor. So it's very easy, you just come in, you like it or not, I mean, you know already that you have that safeguard of someone that is sophisticated and that has done this in the past. So, but that's a syndicate, really. That's a, the way uh, valuation is also established. So, do I qualify to invest? So this is probably one of the questions that some of you might be asking yourself. And uh, there is obviously now, and before, before I, I actually go forward with this, I want to ask you all a question. And I want to ask you a question that is going to be launching right now on, on your screen. And this is if you have ever invested in a startup before. So I think it will be uh, very helpful to understand so that I'm able to really gauge, uh, you know, uh, what kind of audience we're speaking with today. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mention what are the percentages. So if you can all just take a minute to, to vote, I would very, very much appreciate it. And, and I guess that once we close this, uh, this poll in a few minutes, uh, we will, or in a few seconds, we will jump into, into actually defining the, the qualification to invest in startup companies. All righty, so we're going to be closing in five, four, three, two, one, please submit. Let's close the poll here. And the results are as follows. So 36% have 
have invested already in startups from the people that we have on the line, which is a significant amount of people, by the way. Thank you all so much for taking time of your busy schedules. 21% said no, and 43% said no, but they would like to explore investing in startup companies. So let's talk about uh, the definition of, of accredited investors, what it really takes to qualify as an accredited investor. So according to the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, definition of accredited investor, these are individuals that either have uh, $200,000 that they make in salary on a yearly basis, that they have a combined uh, amount with the spouse of uh, 300000 or that they have $1 million in assets, but this doesn't include the, the primary residence of the, of the investor. So this is for, for individuals, right? So now, if we're talking about you investing, and this is, by the way, a limited amount of Americans, so right now only 8.7 million households are actually able to invest in startup companies, which really makes it 1% of the U.S. population, but that's for individuals now talking about the uh, institutional investors, if you are thinking about using an investment vehicle to invest in a startup company, then you're going to have to qualify as an accredited investor, and this means that you need to have at least $5 million and up in, in, in assets uh, under management. No? So that's for the uh, accredited investor. So obviously now I want to ask you all if you think that you qualify as an accredited investor. Let's see what are the, the responses, and we're going to be doing this very, very quickly. So please submit your vote. And let's see where we're where we're here in terms of accredited versus non-accredited people. I mean, as you know, and we will uh, enter into this a little bit later at the end of the presentation. Now, uh, hopefully soon, uh, with this Jobs Act, people that are non-accredited investors will also be able to invest. There's also going to be limitations with that, but it's uh, definitely an exciting, an exciting moment uh, in time. So we're going to be closing the poll now in five, four, three two, one, and we're closing, so please submit your vote or your whichever response right away. Thank you so very much. I'm closing it now. And we had 56% that said yes, 29% that said no to being an accredited investor, and then also we had 15% that said that they're not sure, you know, that they qualify or not as an accredited investor. So now let's talk about the um, Let's see here. Let's talk about now what are the steps to invest, for example, in, in OneBest, right? I mean, uh, there are a ton of uh, uh, companies out there. I mean, I have a ton of respect with, with all the people that have been involved with this space, but now talking about OneBest, what, uh, what it means, right? So first, you're going to pick the, the company that you want to invest in. Then you're going to be clicking on the, on the invest button. And then you will be filling out all the required paperwork. It's quite seamless. It's all done online. We have an investor relations team that are very, very focused on giving a great service. So we're always about helping out and educating. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. The head of the investor relations team, by the way, it's called Jeffrey Fiddleman. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Jeff. His email is jeff jeffrey at onebest.com. And then let's move to the to the next slide. What documents will I need to supply? So there is a there's a different way to really structure, and I'm just going to put it here for for everyone. Or Nathaniel, if you're hearing, why don't you just send the the email of uh, Jeff to everyone on the line, Jeffrey at onebest.com, just in case they have any questions about investing in startups. All right. So the documents that you will have to actually uh, issue or to actually take care of uh, before investing in a company is uh, first we're going to make sure that you are an accredited investor. You're going to have to go through a questionnaire online, uh, the self-certification, all that stuff, and then provide other documents like uh, W-9s, I mean, uh, the identity check. It varies depending on whether the company is doing general solicitation or whether they're doing privately. So by general solicitation, I mean that the company is shouting out loud the fact that they're raising money. I mean, this is something that was uh, very recent that actually came with the Jobs Act. I'll dive into it a little bit later, but it's different. The requirements that are needed for uh, investors that are investing in this type of companies than the ones that are investing in private uh, leaf fundraising uh, type of companies. I mean, in the end of the day, it's all done online. It's very much of a seamless process. So um, yeah. It's not that big of a deal. 
at least from my perspective, I don't know from yours, I guess it depends, from which lens you view at it. So uh, what happens after making a startup invest investment, right? So I guess that one of the most important things, and I was and I was just now on a on an investor panel here in in you know just talking about startups and so forth in Wharton, and and I think that the most important thing is to set expectations for yourself, to set expectations as well with the founder of the company, and to, it's all about trust. Trust and integrity. It could be integrity in everything about uh, you know the founder is conducting himself, the way you're conducting yourself, and the way uh, you know there is a, an integrity also in that relationship between you and the and the company. And and this needs to be established, and the expectations need to be set very very early on. So obviously, as a as an investor, it makes sense when you're able to add value. I mean, if you're, for example, in that industry and you have the know-how, perhaps to help to um, to open certain doors. It could be for financings later on. It could be for partnerships, for uh, business development. And uh, it's a, it's really, it's like I say here. I mean, it's 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 hard to divorce uh, when you are, let's say, an entrepreneur. I mean, I guess as an investor as well to make to have a divorce happening in a in a in a venture a startup you know like relationship between you know that contractual obligation between the company and also the investor then in, then really divorcing your your wife or your or your husband right i mean you're going to be in it for like at least 5 to to 9 years so i guess that with this what i mean is make sure that there is understanding at the beginning especially when the when the investment is closing you know what kind of value you want to add uh, what kind of communication you expect to have from the founder? How are they going to be communicating with you? Uh, how the business is performing? Is it going to be quarterly updates? Is it going to be monthly updates? I think that is important for you to know that and to set that so that you have a good idea how you're going to be updated on how your your investment is performing, right? I think that the last thing you want to do, and I'm I'm speaking from a, like a founder perspective as well, is to be calling day in day out the entrepreneur. I mean, the, let's let's be honest here. The main responsibility of the founder is to give you a return on your investment. So if you're calling, you know, day in and day out, and other investors are doing the same, then it's going to be very very hard to focus on the business and to get that exit um, strategy that you know ultimately is what you're pushing for. So make sure that you have that level of expectation already set. And that the uh, communication, uh, you know, channel with the with the founder or the management team. So, some of the success stories that we've had on the platform, I mean, they're they're very they vary. I mean, Sumexar, for example, they raised with our help 1.5 million. Another one of the best-selling drinks on Whole Foods, uh, Styland, a white combinator company. Uh, they graduated from from that program, and then they came to us, and and they were able to raise very nicely the their seed round with our help. And then imperative, right? I mean, we have the um, and and what I like about imperative is that they did all the all the funnel, right? With with one base because one base is not all about the financing itself. It's also about the support that we provide the the founders from the early beginning. We have now uh, this sister platform that we have. It's called Co-founders Lab, and on Co-founders Lab, not only you're able to meet your co-founder, but also we're matching founders with advisors. With interns, we have a network of over 500 advisors there that are just willing to help, and um, I guess that uh, companies really benefit from that. Is I would say right now the largest uh, uh, entrepreneurial, thanks to, to to what we're building and to and to Co-founders Lab as well, the largest entrepreneurial network in the world. We have right now just on Co-founders Lab alone over 60,000 entrepreneurs registered, which is pretty amazing, no? And Imperative is one of those stories that they use their technology. Uh, they graduated, they went on to OneBest itself, and and they did an awesome job. So um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the stories that we have there, amongst others. And this is co-founders lab that we were talking about. They actually raised money on on our site, and we ended up doing an acquisition uh, because we loved uh, entirely what they were doing. It made sense, and we announced that uh, last year. So let's talk about the Jobs Act, ladies and gentlemen. The Jobs Act. Everyone is talking about it. Um, I think that the big uh, hurdle is probably education, right? When we're talking about Jobs Act, there's two sections specifically that are very important. So one is the Title II, and then the other one is the Title III. I myself, actually being a recovering lawyer, still seeking therapy. I was able to um, to really be part of, of, of this of this movement, of this process early on. 
So I went to the White House, also uh, testified in, in front of the U.S. House of Representatives, and, and really saw this developing, and it was pretty amazing. But just to give you a summary on, on what this means is Title II, for the very first time in, since 1933, companies are now able to advertise the fact that they are raising money. They're able to go to their to their customers, the people that are already educated with their business, to say, "Hey, I'm raising money. Would you like to chip in?" I mean, before it was it was it was chaotic. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you have the Silicon Valley Insider Club. I mean, there are like between 400 to 1,000 investors that were the usual suspects, and uh, it was hard to raise money because you needed to educate people. It's like the it was like the one-on-one -on -one interaction. Now companies get to not only reduce the amount of money that, or the amount of time that it takes to raise the run of financing, but now they're able to go to their customers and say, hey guys, you know, we're doing a round, would you like to be involved? And we're helping with this, we're helping with the compliance as well uh, with these companies and to make sure that uh, everything is done the, the right way. So as a result of this, we've seen a significant decrease on the amount of time that the entrepreneur spends uh, out of the office. So now, normally it, it usually took between seven to nine months to raise an early stage a round of financing, a seed or a series A round. And now, I mean, we've seen companies that are raising in weeks, in months. I mean, the maximum amount of time right now on, on OneBest is, is three months. So that's definitely very exciting because the most important resource as an entrepreneur that you have is the, 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 your time. Your time is the most valuable resource. And you, as an investor, want to know that that entrepreneur is, is focusing on executing. So let's talk about Title Three, and Title Three is what I was referring before when we're talking about the difference between the accredited investors, which we had uh, uh, for the most part on the line today, and then also the ones that uh, are going to be now entering the space that are called the non-accredited investors. So those are people that are not meeting the definition that we touched on uh, before, this is not the 1% of the American population. This is over 300 million Americans that are now finally going to be able to invest in startup companies. So there is obviously some limitations there, especially for those of you that don't qualify. That means that um, you are only going to be able to invest up to 5% if you're making under $100,000 a year, and then a 10% limitation if you are uh, making over $100,000 a year, but you're not meeting the, the requirement of that uh, $200,000 or $1 million in assets that the Securities and Exchange Commission established no? as an accredited investor. So I want to ask you now all uh, a really quick question. How much capital are you considering investing in startups? Let's see, let's see what you say. And by the way, this is all uh, confidential, so nothing is going to be disclosed. It's all anonymous. I'm just going to be sharing percentages, and, and that's it. Just curious to the to the power that we have here in uh, on the line today, no, and and seeing like how what kind of excitement do we have, and and how do you see this, and you know like how how would this represent like in, in terms of percentages of, of your portfolio, no? But anyways, here you have the check sizes, what you're willing to invest in different companies, and, and let's see what you're what you're submitting. So we have right now 70% of the people voted on the line. Please uh, uh, send your vote or your or your response. And I will be closing now in five seconds. So it's five, four, three, two, one. And we're closing here. So please submit your response right now. And the results that we have is 38% said that they're looking to invest less than 25,000. 25% on the line said that they want to invest or looking to invest between 25,000 to 50,000. And then 38% said that they want to invest more than 50,000. So, um, I mean, those are a very, very interesting, uh, uh, you know, pieces of data there. So now we're going to be jumping into the into the Q and A. So if you have any questions, now is the time to actually submit it. You have here um, um, a little go to webinar control panel where you can just submit whichever is right now in your mind. I'm going to be receiving it on my end, and I will be addressing it. We have right now. Uh, about 10 minutes to take some uh, questions. So let me know what's going on in your mind here on the GoToWebinar control panel. Let's see what kind of uh, questions do you have. Let's see. Let's see. While I'm waiting here to um, receive the questions. Okay. So we have the first question is from Joe. So he's asking if most investments are either direct or through SPVs. 
So before, Joe, we jump into uh, addressing your question, I would like to uh, basically explain what's an SPV. So an SPV is a special purpose vehicle. So that means that uh, it's a good way to group investors uh, in the event there is a significant uh, amount of uh, money that's going to be invested by different investors, and they're investing into an entity, and that entity serves as a vehicle to invest in the company. So sometimes it's a good idea, sometimes it's not such a good idea, uh, but in the end uh, of the day, I think that it's a, it's really helpful for 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 different for different from different perspectives. In the event the amount is is significant, one uh, you have one person really uh, representing all the investors. Um, two on the cap table is going to look as one for the founders. So obviously this is in the event there's a ton of investors. This is not going to look messy when the venture capital firm comes in and and reviews the deal because. At the end of the day, venture capital firms, they want to make sure that the, that the cap table is, is clean, right? So let's go now to your question, Joe. And your question is if the investments are direct or through SPVs. So on one best, it varies. It depends on the size of the round. Some of them are actually done via SPVs and some of them are not. So uh, you will be able to, to see that on the, on, the, on the actual documents that you see on the, on the deal room of the company. So uh, it, it varies. It varies on the on the size of the uh, investment. I mean, some companies have a, a pretty large uh, venture capital firm that you know is leading the round. The minimums are very high. So for example, uh, I remember one of them was looking at a minimum check size of $150,000 per individual. So what we did was uh, help uh, in, in for them to really put an SPV, a special purpose vehicle together, so that people didn't have to comply with the $150,000 minimum and people were able to come in and invest as minimum as $5,000 in the deal. So in that case, it's a very good way to get into those deals that are very hard to get into no? if, if, if you don't have that type of, of a bank account. So let's see. So Luca, Luca is asking, can you please explain the cap a little bit more in detail? So what Luca is referring to is the cap that is established on the convertible notes. So a cap is an indirect way of establishing a valuation, but not really. So the cap, what it means is that whenever you invest in a convertible note round, what happens is that the, the cap, if, for example, let's say you're investing in that convertible note round and the company does a $20 million round, with a large venture capital investor, that means that you're not going to be converting your notes into equity at a $20 million valuation. But for example, let's say if you had a $5 million cap, you're going to be converting at $5 million, which is amazing because it gives you that kind of like leg room to actually win and, and get rewards on that valuation right off the bat. So that's that's really the, the, the cap. No? Okay, so we have here um, a very good uh, question from James. Thank you so much, James, for submitting this. So he's asking, what if a deal doesn't close? So if a deal doesn't close on a uh, one best, uh, exactly what happens is we're all about uh, providing as many measures and safeguards for the investors. So every single offering on the platform has a minimum target and then also the maximum target. So if the minimum target has not been met and people have invested, Right? Let's say, let's put a random example. You go into a company, you like a comp company X, and you put uh, $20,000, but the minimum is $250,000 in order to, to, to execute on that uh, roadmap of the company. Then what happens is once the offering is closed and the date is closed, then the money is returned back to the investors because the company was not able to reach the minimum. So now once the company is able to raise the minimum, now the company they, they will be in a, in a good state to actually retrieve the funds and you know the investors have the, the assurance uh, that you know they're going to be able to execute or that they have the money that they need in to deliver their promise. All right, so let's see the, the next uh, question. So the next question comes from it comes from Bill. How do you make money? That's interesting, Bill. I guess that's, a, that's an important question, right? So we make money in a, a couple of, of ways. So one is via subscription fees that we have on co-founders lab, which is completely uh, separate from the transactional side, which is what we're talking today. And then the way we're making money is uh, via our broker dealer. So our broker dealer uh, charges a 7.5% commission on the transaction. And uh, that's only in the event we brought investors to the table. So if the company is bringing investors from the offline world that are already in their first and second degree connections, 
we're not charging money on that. So it's a pretty uh, good and, and a win-win situation, I would say, because the, we're only charging uh, that percentage on investments that would have only happened for the company by being by being on the platform. And also, the good thing about this is that for investors on the OneBest platform, is uh, completely free uh, to participate and to be part of the ecosystem. There's no charge. The, the commission actually comes from the startup, right? So it's not going to be coming from from your investment. So I think that that's a uh, pretty cool, and we are all about uh, you know supporting the the process. So let's take a look at uh, the next question. So it's from uh, Priya Brata. So his question is, how can I invest? So the process is very simple. Just go on the site. You're going to be able to create an account on onebiz.com. And then on that process, you're going to be submitting an application form, and then you will be receiving a phone call from us, uh, from our investor relations team, to make sure that uh, everything is verified and that, in fact, you're an accredited investor and that you're ready to, to actually, you know, interact in the, in the marketplace that we have created. So how can uh, non-U.S. residents invest? So we do uh, accept foreign investors. So if you are foreign, you're more than welcome. It's all done, you know, online via, via the platform. And also, if you have any problems, again, feel free to reach out to our team. We're very responsive. Um, again, you can reach out to Jeffrey, Jeffrey Fiddleman, Jeffrey at OneBest.com, if you have any questions on that regard. And he will be able, and the rest of the team members, to walk you through the different types of, um, of stuff. So uh, let's see. The next question comes from... What industry sectors are most likely to be successful raising capital on OneVest? And this question comes from Philip. So to be honest with you, Philip, uh, we've had uh, successes from all types in all types of flavors. I mean, we've had healthcare companies, we've had e-commerce marketplaces, we've had, I mean, we've had a whole diversity. The most important thing for us uh, as an investment thesis that we have is that the company needs to have a technology component that it's going to uh, increase the chances of doing a, a you know an exit an exit event and to provide the returns for the investors in that horizon of anywhere from like five to nine years. So it really comes in all types of flavors and and if you go on the side, I mean, there's different ways of approaching this and filtering systems. You're able to create your own profile and and we will make sure that uh, you're contacted whenever we have a company that uh, meets that specific vertical that you're excited about. So let's see the next uh, question. So the next question comes from uh, Adebola, and uh, Adebola, it's a, he's saying, does OneBest uh, have uh, startups out of the U.S., and uh, what's the experience with that? So to your question, right now we're only operating with U.S.-based companies, companies that have been incorporated in the U.S. or that have operations here. Uh, and, I mean, we've had companies that have uh, done an expansion and, you know, come to the U.S., and perhaps they were formed uh, in a foreign country, but we do require that they are incorporated and registered here uh, for now. So hopefully that addressed uh, your question. So let's see the next one. So the next one is for Ryan. So he is asking, what is the preferred methodology for valuations? I mean, there's ways uh, of doing this. I mean, obviously the the rounds that we have on the platform, they are already they already have a lead investor and a sophisticated one that has put the the value on it, and you know it's just uh, interested or not, you know, on your end. Now, if you are looking at perhaps leading rounds in the offline world, I guess there is different ways of of evaluating this. I mean, for example, it could be on the revenues, it could be on the month over month growth that they're experiencing there. If the revenues are not there. Uh, then also what you can do is say, uh, uh, you know, if we're talking about early stage, I mean, many of them are going to be, you know, pre-revenue. Sometimes, you know, they have a little bit of revenue and, you know, also the revenue like we were discussing before. But if the revenue is not there, there's ways of tracking and evaluating this. So it could be via KPIs or metrics such as the customer acquisition uh, uh, method and the strategies that they use for that. It could be the engagement in their user base uh, and how they intend to monetize that uh, over the course of time. 
And then also there is, a, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of transparency right now in, in, in the world that we live in and, you know, with all these online tools that you have. So you can, you know, like research competitors, what they've done, what kind of metrics they had, what kind of valuation they raised at. Um, there's a lot of information that is published and disclosed, so you can actually go and, and check that out to really create a, a, a good idea and to have that level of education before you pull the trigger on, on let's say, establishing a value on a, on a company, you know? So, let's see. The next question, and let's see how we're doing with time. So, it's 1.57, so we have time for a few more questions. So, the next question comes from Gake. And the question from Geek is, uh, hopefully I did pronounce uh, well your name. I have problems with my name all the time, so I, I apologize. I, I draw the feeling. So, but anyways, hopefully I, I did get it right. So, the, your question is, when can non-accredited investors start investing? So, the answer to that is once the Title III is implemented, uh, especially for early stage companies, right? I mean, Title III is the, the specific section of the Jobs Act that talks about non-accredited investors being able to invest with limitations. And the idea, I mean, we feel uh, the I mean, the Securities and Exchange Commission was supposed to um, basically tell us uh, what was their, uh, you know, their, their opinion or the implementation. It was supposed to be in January of 2013. We're still waiting for that. There has been some significant delays on that front. But uh, hopefully, I mean, they're saying that perhaps by October we should hear something. I don't know if that's going to be the implementation or not. I mean, uh, last week we had, for example, if you go on into our blog, you will be able to find that Title IV was a, actually, a, you know, it was put in place. We're waiting for 60 days to actually go in full force. But Title IV is more for growth stage companies, companies that are looking to raise all the way up to 50 million. It's a way to do mini IPOs, but it's more for growth stage uh, type of uh, businesses. So I would say for you, Gabe, that as soon as the Title III is implemented, uh, unless there is a, a way of doing it with the Title IV, that will be of uh, a way for you to invest in early stage uh, businesses. So let's take uh, here one more question. And I think, Eric, that uh, that answers your question with regards to the reggae changes. That's the, the type of impact that we're going to see, you know. Again, on our blog, you would be able to see that uh, very well summarized. So let's see. Uh, So the last question that we're going to take, it's from Ron. In what case would you choose debt finance versus equity? I guess that it comes in all types of flavors for us. Um, and I guess that for an investor, I guess that you, you should be comfortable with both methods. Um, it's, it's They're all like different structures, but ultimately it's the way to invest in the company. And also the, the way you structure the offering, like from a perspective of having that lead investor figure. I mean, you have that on equity rounds. You don't have that on convertible note rounds, but in any case, for example, us, we only accept companies that have 20% and up uh, covered of their uh, convertible note round already. So I guess that, you know, ultimately is what you feel comfortable with, you know, like you review the terms and, you know, see if, if this is something that you're okay with and, and for you to make the decision, it will be good for you to, to actually consult with a lawyer before pulling the trigger so that you really get a good understanding of, of convertible notes versus equity. But Ultimately, I mean, it's, it's just a, a different flavor of investing in this in this company. So I want to touch base really quickly on the next day upcoming, upcoming investor events that we're going to have. So we're going to have a digital demo day on uh, April 7th. So basically what these digital demo days are is a, a way for you, uh, for the investors to come online via a presentation in which you see four or five founders defending their business models online. You get to keep your privacy. Nobody knows that you're there. I think that on the last one we had uh, over 300 people, 300 accredited investors on the line, and they were all uh, voting on the market, on the team. I mean, it's, it's really creating that crowdsource of, of the due diligence process and get to, to hear and, and see other people's opinion. There's also conference lines that are uh, established after the demo day so that you can interact uh, with the founder. This is all online. This is all uh, as well, you know, like by you keeping your privacy, nobody knows you're there unless you want to reach out to the investor, you know, later on after the, the, the you know, the demo day. So I would like to ask you all just the last question. If you would like to participate on our upcoming demo day and we will make sure that we secure a spot for you. Normally there is a, a lot of a, a res a response. I mean, people really love those demo days. So it is quite uh, limited. So please, if you just, 
say yes or no. I mean, if you say yes, we will make sure that we reserve, we res we reserve the, the spot for you. And while we are closing this, uh, this poll, please submit your response when you get a chance. Uh, we also have a, a, a Meet Sage, which is one of our companies uh, right now on the platform. And then we also have an in-person demo day that is going to happen in Miami on April 22nd at 7.30 p.m. I don't know how many of you are uh, in Miami, but you know, if you're around, I would definitely uh, encourage you and invite you to, to participate there. So I guess that with that uh, being said, we're going to be closing here the poll. Please submit your questions. Wow, it seems like 80% uh, said yes and 20% said no. So that's pretty awesome. So I guess that the last uh, part that I would like to say is it's been a pleasure to be your host today. We would definitely not be here without you guys. Thank you so much for for your support. Thank you for supporting uh, the startups that we have on the platform as well, for really pushing and getting behind innovation in America. That's really what is going to drive the growth in this country. I mean, 65% of the net new jobs are created by this type of company. So it's uh, an exciting time, uh, an exciting moment. And uh, again, without you, uh, it would definitely not happen. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, any questions from an investment perspective, again, jeffrey at onebest.com. And uh, thank you so much. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.